While I was putting together the last video, I happened to see a verse that is the impetus for this particular video. It's a verse I had disregarded and I looked into, and I think it speaks to this question that, you know, is a, a normal, natural question. So when the rapture happens, we know the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we are alive. Who is that? And you'll hear everything from, oh, it's everybody who's saved, to, no, it's only for an exclusive few, and then everything in between. And I'm going to show you, I have a firm opinion about who is going. My opinion about who isn't going is murkier. I don't have a clear opinion about that. I'm going to leave that to him. I want to show you who is going and give you confidence that you are going. He wants us to be confident that we are going, but he also does not want to give false confidence to people who have serious issues that need to be dealt with. Look, at the end of the day, we all want my sister to go in the rapture, because if my sister goes in the rapture, we're all going in the rapture, okay? If my sister goes in the rapture, you could join the Democrat Party and still go in the rapture. Okay, if she goes, you could dance at the Super Bowl halftime show and still go in the run. The seriousness of it is, the truth of it is, if I had to bet on one of the two of us going, I'd bet on her. I would. But I also have confidence in myself because he wants us to have confidence. And we can check that by just saying, well, what are the requirements? If you say there aren't any requirements other than being saved, good for you. I'm not going to say that. I'm also not going to argue with you on that because you may very well be right. But he goes out of his way to say, here's what I want and here's what I don't want. What's going to happen to the people who fall into the category of doing things he doesn't want? I'm going to leave that to him. I'm going to focus on we can be sure that we're going. There is clearly a wide disparity in the seven letters that begin the book of Revelation. Remember, those seven churches existed 2,000 years ago, but he picked them because he said, that looks like the mirror situation of what I'm going to have globally right before I come. That mess, that general mess, there are some churches that are completely safe in the seven. But it's a general mess. And he says, that looks like the church on the earth right before I come. That's what it's doing there in the book of Revelation. Oh, that's why he can tell churches, I am coming quickly. He means it. And there's a great disparity of what he has to say to the churches. Take, for instance, Sardis. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. You know what that reminds me of, honestly? Honestly, the evangelical church today. They appear alive, but they're dead. Look at what he says. If you won't wake up or watch, uh, either one of those are contained in that Greek word, if you won't wake up, I will come upon you as a thief, and you won't know the hour of my arrival. Did you know you can only know the hour of his coming from the Olivet Discourse? That is the only place you'll ever know that. And wouldn't you know it, the evangelical church has turned its back on the Olivet Discourse. And apparently so was Sardis, because they're not going to know the literal hour of his coming. He tells us in the Olivet Discourse, here's what's going to happen in the hour of my coming. And when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up yourself. Lift up. And then look up because your redemption has arrived. He wants us to know that. It's not a generalized hour of his coming. Olivet Discourse, the only place you'll get it is where you learn the hour of his coming. And if you're not watching for that, I'm afraid he doesn't consider you watchful even though you think you are. And this is exactly the problem inside the church today. Let's get, to, by the way, I, in the past, I want to correct one thing. I want to amend something that I said. In the past, I have said there are two churches that are fully acceptable to him of the seven. Smyrna, which is the persecuted church, 
Nothing else needs to be said. They are golden. They are the heroes of the church age. But for those that are not in persecution, Philadelphia. He's, he's holding open the door to Philadelphia. But there's actually two and a half churches. First of all, he says, even in Sardis. Imagine what he's saying there. Even in Sardis, there are a few names that are worthy to walk with me. But Thyatira is an interesting situation. Half the church is golden, safe, and the other half, you tell me. Listen to what he says to them. I know your works, your love and faith. And by the way, love there is agape love. They love him. They love him. Your love and faith and services and patient endurance. Remember those two words for later. And that your latter works exceed the first. It looks great. It looks great for Thyatira. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Oh, and how he hates Jezebel. Oh, he hates that. It has brought sexual immorality into the church. She's claiming to be a prophetess. The sexual immorality in the church is something that is absolutely unacceptable to him. Unacceptable. But after he's done talking about how much he can't stand what Jezebel is doing to that church, listen to what he says. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. They're safe. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm coming for you. He wants them to have confidence. He wants Philadelphia to have confidence. He wants Smyrna to have confidence. But there are some churches who should not be sent that message. Laodicea, he has nothing good to say about them. But here's what he does say to, about them. I love you. Now, he uses phileo, a lesser form of love, but it's still love. And he says, you need, you need to go through the fire. How could you see them being taken in the rapture is what I'm saying here. How could anyone believe that Laodicea is going in the rapture? He's telling him, you need, to buy, you need to go through the fire so that you will be rich instead of being wretched and pitiable and blind and naked. You need to go through it. Now, people could say, well, that's because they're not saved. You may be right, but here's my problem with that. They have a lampstand. He threatens Ephesus, if you don't find that love you first had for me, I'm going to come, and when I do, I'm going to take away your lampstand. But Laodicea still has a lampstand, so what are we supposed to take from that? I'm not sure. And so that's why I can't form a real, solid, definite opinion of who is not going, but I can form a real, solid opinion of who is going. Let's take a look at that verse that I spotted during the making of the previous video. In that video, we were talking about, at one point, Satan being cast to earth and his angels. Now, that event has one foot in the church age and one foot in the final age, which is getting all Israel saved. He and his angels have been thrown to earth, and the first thing he does is pursue the woman, okay? Who's the woman? Almost everybody agrees, and I happen to also agree, that if it matters, it's got to be Israel. Israel gave birth both to the Messiah and to the church. Israel, our church was founded by Israel, members of the 12 tribes. Now, it's mostly predominantly Gentile because this is the Gentile age. This is the church age. This is the times of the Gentiles. So Satan's casting out has one foot as we close out the church age and end it with the rapture, with the gathering of the elect, and the beginning of the next phase. The first thing he does is he goes after the woman. Specifically, who is that? Well, it has to be the 144,000 who have just been sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel. Nothing scares him more than true Israel turning to the true Messiah, and he pursues them. But they've been sealed and protected. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. And so the woman escapes. The 144,000 
are protected. They are called the first fruits because they're the first fruits, the beginning of all Israel being saved. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. When I saw that, I was like, wait, wait a minute. Who are those people? They're not the woman. They're part of her offspring. That, look, that looks like the church, but he just came for the church. Who are these people? Well, then I thought, well, maybe, I mean, because all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn when they see him, and we certainly see that at the sixth seal where everyone, the great men to the, the least of men, are all hiding and acknowledging the day of the Lamb has come and who is able to stand. So could it be possible that some of the people who lived through that event recognize their mistake and turn to the Messiah? Well, yeah, you know, that, I mean, that's certainly possible. That's not something that's prevalent, by the way, in that final phase. But could, could some of the people at that point who lived through the sixth seal turn to the Lord and be worthy, so to speak, of Satan going after them? Because he's going after them. They must be the real deal. I think there may be a better answer because I was drawn to the word, the rest of her offspring, the rest of her. I, I just knew I needed to see the Greek word. I, I felt like there might be a clue there, and there, and there is. It's Greek word 3062. Look at how it's used in the Greek. Left, left behind. Now, for some reason, when Christians talk about left behind, they're talking about their unsafe family and friends. That's... I know where that comes from. I know where that comes from. That's not being left behind. They were never going. They were never going. That's as silly as me saying, yeah, when the U.S. military went to Afghanistan a few years ago, they left me behind. Oh, were, were you in the military? No. Were you involved in some civilian occupation that serviced the military? No. I was retired. Well, you... You were never going, why do you feel like you were left behind? Well, there's no reason. I was never part of the military. If someone else, a military guy said, yeah, I was left behind. Why were you left behind? Well, there was an incident on the base that I was involved with, and it was still under investigation. Okay, yeah, he has the right to say he was left behind. That Greek word is always part of the whole. There's a whole thing here. Like a teacher could say, I've just started a class. Now, everybody's in the class. And there's a group of them that are so into it, and it's so fun to teach them because they are so interested in it. The rest of the class, still part of the class, they don't get it, and they're not interested. That word is always used like that, as the remaining part of something whole. This, to me, appears to be people who thought they were going who thought they were absolutely going to go in the rapture, who were part of what we call the church. That doesn't mean they were saved, but they named the name of Jesus in some form or fashion. Much like the ten virgins, they were all virgins. They all had some affection toward the bridegroom. They all thought they were going with the bridegroom, but five found out they weren't. Could we be seeing here Laodicea, who realizes uh, our commitment to him was inadequate, and we're going to change that. And not just Laodicea, but any of the church who is in trouble right now, in danger of not being taken, could that be? Because they truly are the left behind. The left behind are part of the whole. We see that in the seven letters to the church. There is clearly a disparity between those that can have confidence that they're going to be taken and those that shouldn't have confidence. Whether they're saved, not saved, or their commitment level doesn't reach what he wants, whatever the answer is to that, I don't have. I can show you what we have to meet, the requirements we have to meet. They're inside Philadelphia. This is the church that he is holding the door open to, the one we're supposed to get inside. It's a church that has no faults. It meets the requirements. This is where we need to be. And I'll tell you up front, the requirements are not difficult. 
They flat out are not difficult if you love Jesus. Difficult is going to Honduras or some other foreign country and embedding yourself into a different kind of culture all for the purpose of saving their souls for Christ. That's heavy lifting. The requirements met in Philadelphia, they are not difficult. They are not difficult at all. Here they are. I know that you have but little power. Oh, I'm so glad he said that. Thank goodness they don't have great power or I immediately would turn around from the open door and head somewhere else because that's not me. Little power, okay, okay, fine. So far, okay. And yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Are those difficult things? They took the Bible seriously. They took the word of God seriously and they didn't deny his name. Now look, we can all say, well, I can improve on, yeah, I do those things, I can improve. I could take the word more seriously and I could love him better and be bolder for him. We all do that. But are those characteristics of you? Would people who know you say, oh yeah, no, that's, that's her, or that's him, yeah, yeah. Loves that Bible, loves the word of God, and you know, yeah, he, he speaks out. Yeah, he le he'll let you know, she'll let you know, yeah. They believe, they're believers. They're humble, but they'll let you know. Is that a difficult thing? And let me say this, keeping the word. When you tell people not to listen to the Lord's discussion about his coming at the Olivet Discourse, you are not keeping his word. You are keeping people from his word. The greatest teaching in the Bible about his coming, and you're telling people not to listen to it because it's not for them, dangerous. How dangerous? I don't know. You need to stop that nonsense. Philadelphia would pour over the Olivet Discourse. They would be shocked to find out that in the last days, there are churches turning away from his teaching about his own coming. Shocked. So they keep his word, and they don't deny his name. Then there's a mention of those that are Jews but are not. They're lying. They aren't Jews. And he says he's going to bring them and have them bow down at their feet eventually so they'll know he loved Philadelphia. And again, he uses agape. He agapes Philadelphia. So probably there was a situation in the first century where fake Jews were showing up saying, oh, we're the chosen people. You're not. You're not. You're not. They're going to find out eventually, no, the Church of Philadelphia was very much his people. He agaped them. And then we get to the big one. This is not the deal breaker. This is the deal maker. We want to get this right. Here it comes. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. So that's it. They're doing something that he absolutely loves. And there are two things, two components to this that we need to understand. I've talked about this in the past, but folks, we're coming upon the beginning of the seventh year of the Revelation 12 sign in about a month from the date of this being published. We've got about a month and the seventh year of the Revelation 12 sign, I think the most important year since it was given in September 23rd of 2017. We need to revisit this. We need to make sure we understand because he's flat out saying, because you do this, I'm going to keep you. Yes, a couple other things are in play here. They keep his word. They don't deny his name, okay? And, and they're not involved in nonsense. That's the silent part here. They have, they have no criticism. They're not doing stupid stuff. They're not doing aberrations that are not part of the Christian faith. They are, they are sticking to the, the fundamentals of the faith, and they do something that he absolutely loves. They follow a command he has given about patient endurance. Now, patient endurance shows up on two other churches. You might be surprised it shows up in the loveless church, Ephesus. They have patient endurance. And I'll just tell you up front, that word can absolutely mean persevere. Look what he says when he uses it with Ephesus. 
I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. So that's clearly talking about you have patience and endurance. You've continued on. You're not getting tired of doing that. Unfortunately for them, it's all, you know, just show because they don't have the love for him. That is the most important thing he's looking for. But they're doing the actions. They're doing the actions, and they haven't gotten tired of doing them. So that's one kind of patient endurance. He also tells us that the good ones in Thyatira are also enduring patiently. But something else is going on. There's absolutely patience going on in in Philadelphia. But it's key that we understand that Greek word and really understand it. Take a look at this. Let's look at it in the Greek and a linear first. You keep the saying of the under-remaining. Technically, literally, that word is under-remaining. It's translated as endurance of me. So he's saying, you keep the saying of me, of what I've commanded, about under-remaining. Well, that's interesting, under-remaining. Let's take a look at Strong's and get the actual definition of that word. The first definition is remaining behind. Now, that's not left behind. That's different. Left behind is like a divorce almost. Remaining behind is temporary. That's the position the church is in. He went away. We remain behind. He gave a number of parables about remaining behind, where the master would go away and then the servants would do what they were going to do, or the the vineyard owner went away and the the workers did whatever they were going to do. So this is an important part of the faith, and it's important to Jesus. The how we respond to his command about remaining behind. Certainly, patience and endurance is embedded in that word, but think about it for a moment. You've probably been in the situation, I I can remember a situation where I remained behind, where, you know, my father and mother went ahead to the new town that my father's job was in, and we put somewhere, and then they came back for us. Okay, we were remaining behind temporarily. Imagine it in the first century. If you remain behind today, you're still going to be in constant contact with whoever left you there in that situation. But we're more, as a church, like the first century. A man, a husband tells his wife, I'm going ahead to Corinth because there's a real business opportunity for us. But that's a couple hundred miles away. I know, I know. But just remain here. I'll go ahead and make sure that job is what I think it is. Find a place for us to live and I'll come back for you. Now, when he gets on a boat and leaves, it's radio silence. She knows nothing. She has to continue on. And what Jesus is saying, I gave a command about that situation, that very situation, and you followed it. And because you followed it, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. we got to know what the command was. And isn't it obvious? Isn't it what he just told the prior church? If you will not watch. I will come upon you as a thief. He said he gave that as a command. Let's go to the Olivet Discourse. Here's the command. What I say to you, I say to all or everybody. Watch. He just issued a command about his coming. This was so. This is the key element of our remaining behind that we never get tired of looking for him and waiting for him. As Paul talked about eagerly awaiting the day. That woman who's been left behind in the first century, you better believe when a ship came in, she ran down to see, is that from Corinth? She's asking people, is that from Corinth? Because somebody who might get off might have run into her husband. If there was a caravan coming through, were you in Corinth? Were you in Corinth? Did you happen to see my husband? She's watching and she's eagerly awaiting and she doesn't get tired of doing that. He loves that. He loves that. And that's what Philadelphia does. And listen finally what he says to them. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize or steal your crown. Hang on to that, he's saying. That's precious. That's what's going to keep you from the hour of trial. It almost sounds like you could lose it if you let somebody come along and steal it away from you. And I'm telling you, the church is trying to steal away 
the things he wants you to watch for. They're all in the Olivet Discourse, specifically Luke's version. When you see that, it's the only place that you'll know the hour of his coming. And when you understand that, I want you to get a sense of what he's looking for when he arrives. Understand that Satan and his angels are being cast to earth. The world is terrified. Men fainting. People falling over with fright, not knowing what's happening. We know from the sixth seal there's a giant earthquake. That's the dead in Christ rising. He is sending his angels out, and we are told, lift up your head and look. All this commotion, all this thing going on, you lift up your head and look because you listen to his commands. You listen to what he said. It was important to you to find out, what do you want, Lord? I'll do it. And there, as he is coming in the sky, in the heavens, in the air, looking down, he sees his people looking up. What an amazing picture, and he knows these are the ones who know what I said. These are the ones who took it to heart and kept my word. And they knew they were supposed to watch, not just watch in some general sense, watch for the things I just told you to watch for. They got it. Now, he already knew that, but what a beautiful sight for him to see his church looking up. Everything, everything going to heaven in a handbag, so to speak. Satan being cast out of heaven, panic on the earth, the church looking up. No, we know what's going on. Following the one place that you can get this information, the Olivet Discourse, the one place the modern-day church tells you, no, it's not for you. And look at them. Look at them, oblivious to what's going on. There's no reason, no reason for any of us to not be part of the Church of Philadelphia. It's simple. It's easy. But if you let some man or some men come along and steal it away from you, there's a crown for those who love his appearing. How can you say you love his appearing and you disregard his instructions on his appearing? They don't, they don't fit together. That does not fit together. That does not compute. Don't be Sardis, who won't know the hour of his coming unless they change. Be Philadelphia. Watch. Watch for the things he told you to watch for. These are important. Never been more important than for the end-time church, the end-time church-age church. This is it. Church age is coming to a close, and he's telling us, get these things correct. Behold, I am coming soon. He means us and he means now.